Hey, so we've been together working through a series called Seven Blessed Assurances. If you've missed any of it, um, what we've been doing is preaching through week by week the seven I am statements in the book of John. So if um, if you have a Bible this morning, I want to invite you to open to the Gospel of John. And um, Gospel, it's um, it means good news, but the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, if you've never heard those names before, um, these are they're called the 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 Gospels of the New Testament, and they uh, witness and testify to the life, death, and resurrection of the person of Jesus. And uh, John is a, a little bit different in his Gospel. We have three synoptic Gospels, which are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, they're very similar in the formatting of how they're written, but John uh, John is more poetic in the way that he writes. Um, I'd say he's the more emotional one of all the writers. Um, he's, uh, he's poetic, and he brings a lot of imagery into his writing writings. And um, and one of the unique features of the Gospel of John are these I am statements that are really the basis and the structure of how he lays out his gospel. And they they build on top of each other. And so we, you can see on the screen up here, we've been working through these. Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. I'm the light of the world. I'm the door, the gate. I'm the good shepherd. Last week, we talked about Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And uh, and today, we're going to talk about a, a big one. I am the, the way, the truth, and the life. And, um, and all of these um, we've mentioned throughout the weeks, what you need to know, um, if you didn't know, is that these are our claims of Jesus's identity. And as we've been talking through the series, they're blessed assurances that these are um, for those of us that are building an identity in our lives upon the foundation of who Jesus is. These are assurances for your life that you can take to the bank. They won't fail you. They're firm in their foundation of truth that Jesus is the bread of life. Jesus is the the door. We've, we've worked through all of these things, and uh, yeah, important verse just came up. Hebrews 13 uh, is really the, the backdrop of all of these, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so as we've been working through this, what you have to see, and, and what I, I hopefully have, have done my best to do, is that um, as we open the narrative scripture, we understand that the scripture is one revelation of Jesus Christ, and um, it's telling a story, and Jesus is not just pulling these statements out of thin air. He's drawing upon the narrative and the history and the culture of the, the people that this book was written to. And, um, and all of these things that were written, um, he says, I, I am. These are true of me. I am uh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In fact, we just read a few weeks ago, before Abraham was, I am. Uh, Jesus is the eternal one. He, he was, he is, and he is to come. And so as we look at these statements, Jesus is showing us, hey, I'm not just presently in this moment as I, I speak to my disciples and telling them, hey, I'm the bread of life. Um, I have been the bread of life. I am the bread of life, and I forever will be the eternal bread from heaven. And so this week is, is really unique. Um, hopefully you've been um, with us in the series because um, this statement we're going to talk about today, I am the way, the truth, and the life, is really a summation so far of all the statements we've already talked about. Um, this isn't a new statement. This is kind of a, a recap of all of the statements. And um, and we kind of, um, I think, miss a lot of context in this statement, I am the way, the truth, and life, because this, this ends up to be kind of a theological um, position point that a lot of people will just take this verse and they'll preach it. And, and I'm not even saying it's wrong to do that because it's it's true that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And so we kind of just take this verse by itself as a theological statement. Um, but it's, it's also very unique in the context of when and where and how Jesus says these words. And that's what we're going to look at today, this morning. Um, I'm going to share this quote up front says this, that God is the Father who is the source of life. Jesus is the Son of the Father, confers God's life. But even more, is God's life-giving word embodied in the flesh for the life of the world. The Spirit of God is the power of life and the agency through which life is received. And to a large extent, then, the Gospel of John sketches the identity of God through what God does, and even more specifically, primarily through the various ways in which God gives life through the Son and through the Spirit. And... Uh, 
If you want, you can snap a picture of that one. I know it's, it's really rich, it's really dense, and um, if you're showing up and hearing this message for the first time in this series this morning, all of these messages have been very, very dense. Uh, so I need you to put your academic caps on this morning and, and hold on with me. Um, and I told you there's just no other way to do it. That's the, the, the whole point of what John is doing, uh, that these claims that Jesus is, they're irrefutable, and you need to have this book as the lens and the filter through which we see these statements, um, because they're not standalone statements, but what Jesus is doing as John even opens his book, he says, I'm the eternal word that was in the beginning, that the word was life and it gave life to everything. And Jesus says, look, I, I am that word eternally. And so, um, so you have to look through the, the narrative and the story of Scripture and where these things show up that Jesus is basing this claim off of to say, this is who I am. I am. Some of you guys have, um, it's kind of dying away, but how many of you guys just have a really strong last name in your family? Um, Lindsay's last name, this is, uh, you guys probably never know this if I didn't tell you, um, Lindsay's maiden last name was Zizniski. Um, really fun to say, even more fun to watch people try to spell it, uh, Zizniski. It's got a lot of like hidden vowels in there that you wouldn't guess were there, and uh, it's so complicated we made it our Wi-Fi password. Um, <laughs> but there's, Lindsay's brother's like the last like seed of the Zizniski, and if he doesn't have children, then that name might die off. Um, but, but some of you guys, there's like a rich history and a culture of a name, right? And a name means something. And so when I say that last name, uh, my last name is, is Galbraith or Galbraith, and people are always like, how do you say it? And I'm like, I really don't know. Uh, like, that's, that's how great of a last name I have. I don't even know what the proper pronunciation is of it. And I did one of those like spit swab tests, you know, that like tells you where you're from, and that's not helpful. Um, it's always updating you, and it's like, oh, we found relatives on this continent over here, and I'm like, I thought I was from that continent, so I don't know where it came from, okay? But what Jesus is doing is he's pulling on his heritage, he's pulling on his history, his unique identity, and then he says, look, I, I am. These things that you already know, that you think you know, I'm actually the truth of those, those things. And so um, as we look at this this morning, I am the way, someone say way, the truth, someone say truth. And someone say life. Um, so this is this is big, and I don't even. I, I'm not even gonna like try to get deep into all of them. It's, there's just too much because he makes three separate claims in this one statement. So what you need to know is that these are summations of all the statements we've talked about so far. Um, and so um, the the other really unique thing to this passage um, is that. Most of these other statements we've looked at, I'm the bread of life, I'm the light of the world. You guys remember for the first like four statements, we were talking about the, the fall feasts and the festivals. Um, we had Hanukkah and we had the Feast of Unleavened Bread with Passover and we had Sukkot, the Festival of Shelters. And uh, all of these were like unique settings and places where Jesus came and he showed up at these festivals and then he said, I, I am. And he made these statements that I'm the fulfillment of all of these things. And so these were all really public statements, but this next one is, is really unique, and you might not have seen it before, but as we move into this portion of the book of John, we move into the events of the final Passover. Um, so it, it's kind of unique that this started, I am the bread of life, we started with Passover, and now as we move into this section of scripture, um, we're coming on Jesus' last supper, his, his final Passover, and, um, and so this statement's unique in that this is a, a much more personal um, delivery that Jesus brings. He, he's not speaking to crowds. He's not speaking to multitudes. He's, he's speaking to his closest followers. Um, as the events of his, his death um, are about to unfold. And so it's in the moments before his, um, his betrayal and his arrest that he speaks these words that we're going to read about today and also the words next week as he makes the claim, um, I am the, the vine. And so um, it's also intimate in just understanding that those events are the backdrop. This is like Jesus's farewell address. Um, now, that, that's something we need to get into perspective of to understand this morning um, because as a farewell address, we just kind of shrug our shoulders and we're like, yeah, what's the big deal? He came back, right? Uh, we already know the end of the story um, and 
they knew the end of the story because Jesus told them, but did they like fully believe that reality? Not really. Um, because Jesus is saying, look, I'm about to be turned over. I'm about to be put to death. And, um, and as Jesus, you'll see in a few moments as we read the passage, um, Jesus is like, yo, I'm going away. And they're like, where are you going, Jesus? You can't go. You can't go. And, um, and he's like, no, don't worry about it, okay? Um, all of us are like, no big deal. We're not worrying about it because we already know the, the truth that came on the other side of the resurrection. But for his disciples that have walked with him, that have lived under his ministry, and now he's coming to these statements and he's saying, hey, this is, this is my last goodbye um, for now. This is my farewell for now before I'm, I'm turned over to the accusers yeah, that are going to put me to death. And, um, and so this morning, um, Jesus says, look, I'm the, the way, the truth, and the life. I was, I am, and uh, I, I still am to come. And so the, the main point this morning, I'll give it to you up front, um, that you need to understand is that there is no other way, there is no other truth, and there is no other life. This is the, the claim Jesus is making, not just, look, I'm a way and I'm a truth and I'm a life, which is very unique to the culture and present day we live in. But Jesus is saying, no, there is no other way. There is no other truth and there is no other life apart from me. And um, so if you would, let's open to John chapter 14 and we'll just begin to work our way through the narrative this morning. Jesus says this, and, and remember this opening statement, don't let your hearts be troubled. Why? Why? Because Jesus is about to be taken away. And, and Jesus says, you can't come to where I'm going. And so he says, look, don't let your hearts be troubled. Instead, trust in God, but also trust in me. There is more than enough room in my father's home. If it were not so, I would not have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you. When everything is ready, I will come and I will get you so that, and I, you got to catch this, I, I bring this out anytime I can, I highlight it. Um, the story of the creation in the beginning, the story of God's unfolding plan of salvation, and the story of the end to come, the, the heavens and the earth, the, the whole point is that God would be with his people. I will be your God and you will be my people. It's his heart, it's his design to be in community with us. And so he says, look, I'm going to do these things. I'm going away to the Father and I'm gonna come back and get you. I'm preparing this place, why? Um, so that you will always be with me where I am. And you know the way to where I'm going. No, we don't, Lord Thomas said. We have no idea <laughs> where you're going. So how can we know the way? And Jesus says, look, I am the way the truth and the life. And, you know, you're supposed to just be like, okay, I get it, Jesus. And I understood that joke, you know. Um, no one, no one can come to the Father except through me. He, he explains, look, if you really know me, then you would know who my Father is. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him. Now I'm going to pause it and hopefully you're keeping continuity as I keep breaking it up for you. But Remember, they've heard all the previous statements at this point. They've heard Jesus' claim that, that before Abraham, I was, I am. They've heard, I'm the light of the world, I'm the resurrection of life, I am the, the good shepherd, I'm the gate, which is also a reference to the way, I'm the, the passageway. We've talked about this. All these statements are claims to eternal life. Jesus is like, I am the entrance to eternal life. And uh, Jesus is also communicated pretty clearly throughout this gospel that I and the Father are one, that, that we are within each other. But Jesus, in each statement, with further clarity, with like a deeper stake in the ground, like, can you not see the flashing light in front of you? Um, just read the statement, I am. So Jesus makes it clear again. He says, you would know who the Father is, um, and from now on you do know him and you have seen him. So in verse 8, Philip says, Lord, show us the Father, and we'll be satisfied. And Jesus is like, do you believe? Did, did, I, did I not just tell you that I, we are one? Verse 9, Jesus replied, have I not been with you all this time, Philip, and yet you still don't know who I am? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So why are you asking me to show him to you? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I speak are not my own, but my Father who lives in me does his work through me. 
And if your head swirls in any of this and you're like, I don't fully get it, it's all right. That's what they were feeling too, okay? And just read it again and read it again and read it again. And when it begins to make sense is when the Spirit of God that we'll talk about here this morning takes up residence in who you are, who reveals all truth, who reveals all things. Um, Then you're like, okay, I still don't get it, but I know it, right? I'm experiencing it. I don't understand how it works. Uh, I can't explain the science to you of God, um, but I know he created science, so I'm not too worried about it, okay? Um, and, And so you don't have to fully understand it, but Jesus, I mean, he's like, this is the most simplest way. I'm going to pause real quick. Quick tangent. Um, for those of you who are like me and you suck at math, like math does not make sense. It's like, uh, I don't see Sam Howell this morning, but he's a math tutor, okay? They explain like, you know, there's this complicated algebraic problem and it's all gibberish, right? And so then they like invent a new way to explain it that's really dumb and simple. It's like math for dummies. And they're like, doesn't it make sense? And you're still just staring at it like it's It's all gibberish, like I'm not a math teacher, okay? And Jesus, like, look, this is, I'm so complex that this is the the easiest way I can explain it to you, and if you don't get it, like, I don't know where the help is for you, like, this is who I am, okay? I'm giving it to you plain, and um, so let let me back up a little bit here. Jesus says, don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? For the words that I speak are not my own, but are my Father who lives in me, and he does his work through me. Verse 11, just, look, just, if you don't understand, just believe it. Believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me. Or at least believe because of the works, the same works that I have done, and even greater works because I am going to be with the Father. 13, you can ask for anything in my name and I will do it so that the Son can bring glory to the Father. Yes, ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. If you love me, then obey my commandments. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. This connects. This connects back. So let me leave you at 17, but let's remember the connection to verse 3, where Jesus says, so that you will always be with me where I am. Now, hinging off that statement, Jesus in 17 says this, he is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. Someone say truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and it doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. Now I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. Soon the world will no longer see me, but you will see me since I live. You also will live. When I am raised again to life, you will know that I am in my Father, and you are also in me, and I am in you. You get the equation, okay? 21, to those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. And because they love me, my Father will love them, and I will love them and reveal myself to each of them. If it makes sense to you, good for you, okay? This, we, we didn't get into the Trinity a ton in this series, but eternally, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all equally God, are, are one person, one, one God and three persons, three and one and one and three, okay? And, and Jesus is revealing this to his disciples. They're like, hey, I don't get it. And he's like, don't worry, there's a third person of the Holy Spirit. He's going to come, he's going to live in you, and he's going to reveal truth to you. And, and then things will make much more sense. And... And he's also saying, look, if you love me, if you obey my commandments, there's this gift. You know the the passage about God gives good gifts to his children? It's about the Holy Spirit. If you love me, I'm going to give you the gift of my spirit and place the spirit in you. It's not about financial blessings. It's not about uh, manna from heaven, although Jesus says, look, I am the manna from heaven. Where else are you looking, right? It's not about the, the house or the car or the health. Jesus says, if you love me, obey my commandments, and then I will give you an advocate. I will give you a gift, and he is the Holy Spirit. And when I give you him, I will reveal myself to you through the power of my spirit. Uh, Maybe this quote will help out a little bit this morning. Daryl Johnson says this in his book, Experiencing the Trinity. 
Realize that when we say yes to Jesus as Savior and Lord, we are immersed into the love and the life of God the Father and are immersed into the grace and truth of God the Son. And we are immersed into the power and the purity of God the Spirit. Most of us are not yet experiencing and appropriating all that was given to us at conversion. We know something of the love, power, forgiveness, and freedom, and transforming glory, but we have yet to know the fullness available in the triune God. As Grady was saying this morning, it's like, you know, he was kind of talking about the garbage analogy. Um, I'll go to the other side of it this morning. We're not yet fully, there's, there's deeper parts of us that need to be revealed. There's deeper revelations that, that it's not that I, I got into a kind of a conversational theological thing with someone that was asking questions about this um like how can you get more of god hasn't he already given you himself in his fullness like yes he has i mean everything jesus is everything that's the father's is mine everything that is mine i give to you you are in me i am in him he's in the father it's all there but that doesn't yet mean that our finite little, like if you can just imagine how puny you are this morning, like turn to someone next to you, just say you're a small person. <laughs> if we're, we're not as great as we think we are. That like the, the realities of this have to be mined out in our life. Deeper truths have to continue to be revealed. God will continue to reveal himself. And it's not that he's keeping himself from you. It's that you're just too dumb to understand him. Okay? Makes you feel a little bit better about your faith in him and less about your faith in yourself, hopefully. It's not that God's keeping things from any of us. It's that we just, we, we, we're human, okay? And... and and so try to insert yourself into this equation and understand that the fullness of God is available to you, but most of us, we're just not yet, and we probably never will be this side of the resurrection, understand the fullness of God that is available to all of us. And so Jesus makes this statement. He says, look, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. I gave you the main point up front. There is no other way. There is no other truth. There is no other life. And um, this morning, I, I want to really talk a, a lot, probably more than anything else, about truth, because truth is unique to this statement that we haven't talked about in the other statements so far. If you were with us last week, we did a whole sermon, a whole message on Jesus being the resurrection and the life. Jesus this week says, look, I am the life. So we've already tapped into that quite a bit. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the way, but we've also already heard a lot about that because Jesus talks about, I'm the door, I'm the gate. And we broke that open into detail that Jesus is the way. And all of these statements we've talked about are really, um, in part, all conversations about eternal life and Jesus saying that eternal life is through me. So, so we've, we've gathered that if you've been with us in this series. So today I want to, as much as I can, put the emphasis on this word truth. Someone say truth. Um, Jesus, we know, is the, the life and the sustainer of life eternally. We know that he's the passageway to life, but then he makes a statement on truth. And what you need to understand about truth, or really anything this morning in these claims Jesus makes, is that the real thing can never be substituted. That the real thing can never be substituted. And, and I wanted to share a story real quick um, about this time I went to this restaurant with my buddy Eric. Um, Eric, he's a, a fun guy. I don't know if you guys have that friend that's just like too much fun. And um, we were out at a restaurant with a whole bunch of friends and we went to Olive Garden. Anyone like that place? Um, and so we're going to Olive Garden. And if you've been there recently, you know, um, out on the table, um, there's like all these like colorful packets of sugars and sweeteners and, and all this stuff. And um, Eric had, had put some sugar into his cup of water and, um, and then like messing with him. I, I was ripping these little packets of all kinds of stuff open and just dumping them into his water. And, and he would see me do it. And then to like prove a point of how a daredevil he is to the table, he'd like dramatically drink it. And then I'd add more sugar to it. And then, and we just kept mixing it up. And I mean, uh, it's amazing how many substitutes there are. Like we got the blue one and the pink one and the yellow one and the white one. Like there's, there's so many substitutes and none of them are sugar. You know what I'm saying? Like I, I, and I know some of you after this message today are going to be like, hey, let me tell you about Stevia. It's, it's really good. Um, 
It's not sugar, okay? It's not sugar. Um, there, there's only, and, and if you want to get the real stuff, buy the bottles of Coke from Mexico because they're made with real cane sugar. You know what I'm talking about? Like, that's the real stuff. And, and there's no substitute for it. I, I don't care, you know, what, it's just not the same. It, it's not the real thing. And, uh, and so I'm dumping all these, like, sweeteners in there. We're having a good time. And um, he turns away in conversation. He's talking to somebody. And uh, my, my friend passes me uh, the salt from the ear to the table. And they're like, hey. And I was like, ah, yeah. So that kind of looks like sugar, right? So, I mean, I I wasn't like, it wasn't held back at all. I mean, I gave a generous amount. I I unscrewed the cap and I dumped all this salt in there. He didn't see any of it happen. So he turns back. We're having a good conversation, whatever. Um, And then I go to open another packet of sugar. And I dumped the sugar in the water, so he thinks I'm just adding more sugar. And uh, he's like, how much sugar are you going to put in my water? And then he grabbed it real dramatically, and he sucked it up through his straw. And you could see, like, his eyes and his cheeks. And, like, what did I just do? And um, it was, like, one of the greatest moments. <laughs> there's, there's things that look like the real thing that aren't the real thing. And in this life, there's a lot of substitutes offered, but there, there is nothing that can be substituted for the real thing. And Jesus says, look, there is no other truth. There is no other way. There is no other life. There are substitute lives, and there are substitute truths, and there are substitute ways, but none of them can amount to, and none of them will lead you to eternal life. Because I am the only way, and I am the only truth, and I am the only life. C.S. Lewis said this, he said, If I find in myself a desire for which nothing in this world, no experience in this world can satisfy, then the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. If there's things, because we've all been there, if if you can remember your life pre-conversion, we try to substitute life, and we try to substitute truth, and we try to substitute ways and pathways and directions, but eventually we all come to the same conclusion that none of these things satisfy. None of these things have fully fulfilled us in the way that only Jesus can. And and when we finally stumble upon this truth that, that Jesus actually knew what he was saying when he said it. That Jesus, the claim that he made thousands of years ago, is true today because it's true. Because truth can't be substituted. He is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. And um, I told you we're going to spend a lot more time talking about truth, so I actually want to back the pages up to bring you guys to John chapter 8. John chapter 8 brings us to a really big revelation of Jesus as the source of truth. Um, We didn't preach through this statement specifically because this is one of the absolute I am statements. Um, And it it wasn't one of the seven we were talking about. But if you can keep into focus the passage from 14 this morning, Jesus says, I'm the way, I'm the truth, and the life. And remember that he's He's intimately speaking to his group of closest followers who have recollection and knowledge of all these past conversations. And one of those is here in the event of Jesus' ministry in chapter 8. Jesus continued, You are from below, and I am from above. You belong to this world. I do not. That is why I said that you will die because of your sins, for unless you believe that I am who I claim to be, you will die in your sins. Who are you? They demanded. Jesus replied, the one I have always claimed to be. I have much more to say to you and much to condemn, but I won't, for I say only what I have heard from the one who sent me. He is completely, what's that word? Truthful. But they still didn't understand what he's talking about when he said he was talking to his father. So Jesus said, when you have lifted up the Son of Man on the cross, then you will understand that I am he. I do nothing of my own, but I say only what the Father has taught me, and the one who sent me is with me. He has not deserted me, for I always do what pleases him. Then many who heard him say these things believed in him. And Jesus said to the people who believed in him, you are truly, someone say truly, 
You are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Some of you guys didn't know those words were from the Bible. you got like different movies you're quoting right now. The truth will set you free. They came from Jesus. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. What's he talking about? It's not a witness statement. It's a witness of who I am. I am truth, and the one who is truth will set you free. And you will know the one who is truth, because if you believe in me, then the truth will set you free. It continues, uh, John chapter 8, verse 41 through 47. He's convicting these guys. No, you're imitating your real father. They replied, we aren't legitimate children. We are illegitimate children. God himself is our true father. Jesus told them, if God were your father, you would love me because I have come to you from God. I'm not here on my own, but he sent me. Why can't you understand what I'm saying? It's because you can't hear me, for you are children of your father, the devil, and you love to do the evil things that he does. He was a murderer from the beginning. He has always hated the what? Truth. Because there is no truth in him. And we see the contrast. Jesus is like, look, you can be a father to him, you can be children of him, or you could be children of the truth, but in this option over here, there is no truth. There's only weak substitutes of stevia and common law and all those other nasty things that aren't the real thing. Those are from the devil, the father of lies, There's no truth in him. So when I tell you I'm the truth, you naturally don't believe me, which you, which of you can truthfully accuse me of sin? And since I am telling you the truth, why don't you believe me? For anyone who belongs to God gladly listens to the words of God, but you do not listen to me because you do not belong to God. This is huge. Truth being a, a claim to Jesus' identity. Jesus says, I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life. But truth is a, a very unique statement in this I am statement that he hasn't made this claim other than this portion we read here in chapter 8. If you guys can recall from the Old Testament, um, Numbers 23, this is a, a statement of God. And it says in Numbers 23, 19, that God is not a man, so he does not lie. He is not human. He does not change his mind. Has he ever spoken and failed to act? Has he ever promised and not carried it through? So God, not being a man, he doesn't lie. And God is the only one who doesn't lie because he's God. Because truth originates with him. So when Jesus claims, I am truth, he's claiming, I am God. Uh, I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, and we are one. And also, there's this other thing we haven't talked a lot about, but I'm going to send you an advocate. I'm going to send you the Spirit, because he's also God, and he is going to live in you, and he's going to reveal truth to you. What's truth? Oh, I'm truth. And those who have not seen me will see me, because I will be in them, and they will be in me. Are you catching it? Truth will live inside of you, for I am truth. We need to understand about truth this morning, you can write this down, it might help you understand it, is that truth is the highest and ultimate authority. Truth is the highest and ultimate authority. Philosophically, we're always trying to find out truth. In the judicial system, we're always trying to uncover the truth. We live in a world that, that has alternative facts, has alternative knowledge, and, and deep Within all of us, we're like, we just want to know the truth because truth is unshakable. Truth is immovable. Truth is the highest place of authority. You don't argue with truth. The reason we have debates is because we don't believe in what the truth is. But if you could discover truth for what it is, that truth is truth and the truth will set you free, we wouldn't have to have debates about it because truth is self-evident. Truth is, that wasn't in my notes, but it's good. Let's go again. Truth is self-evident. Scripture is, is, that's why we hold it as truth, because it's the revelation of God, and God is truth. God is the source of truth, and so truth is the highest authority. And um, the other thing that, that we don't 
really pick up on again, and this has happened in a few of the statements. We talked about it with the Good Shepherd. Jesus, in this claim of truth, is also claiming to be king. He's claiming to be rule and reign, um, his authoritative kingship. Now, that might not mean anything to you, but if you can think into ancient times before democracy and presidents and all that good stuff, um, think of, of theocracy or dictatorship or um, a, a nation ruled by a king. And, and it, we can see it through the ancient civilizations. I want to give you one example, though there's, there's many um, truth itself is a claim to authority and it's a claim to kingship because truth is the highest authority. So truth lies with the highest position of authority, which is the king. And um, this is why you'll see things in the passages like Esther or in Daniel. And the thing that the, the king speaks, it can't be revoked because once it's been spoken, it's truth. Once it's been spoken, it can't be undone because it's an authoritative command of truth from the king. I said, so this will be. Um, so there's an example here, Esther 8. Now, go and send a messenger to the Jews in the king's name, telling them whatever you want, and seal it with the king's signet ring. But remember, whatever has been written in the king's name and sealed with his signet ring can never be revoked. So again, all these statements Jesus makes, they're they're offensive. They're threats to the powers that be. Jesus says, I'm truth. He's claiming, look, my truth has a higher authority than your authority. Uh, you religious leaders who think that you're the keepers of the law and you're the ones who reign and rule and make judgment calls on all of this, no, I'm the source of truth. And your king, Herod, and your governor's pilot, guess what? I am truth. Are you saying you're king? I'm saying I'm truth. And truth is the highest authority. As it is said, let it be. That's why in creation, God can speak things into existence. And he can say, as Lord over creation, he can say, let there be light. And there was light. Let there be animals to fill the land and fish to fill the sea. Let it be. And so it is done. Because truth lies with the highest authority, the highest king, the highest ruler. And Jesus is saying, I am truth. John 18, this is, um, remember the, the, the statements on the way, the truth, and the life. This is a progression, and we're coming on to the events of Jesus's trial. And um, if you fast forward to John chapter 18, um, there's this, this interesting ruling with Pilate and Jesus as he's being accused um, and getting ready to be put to death. And so the religious leaders, they bring him to Pilate, who was not a Jewish authority. He was a Roman authority as governor of the province. And they, they put him before Pilate and it says this, then Pilate went back to his headquarters and he called for Jesus to be brought to him. Are you the king of the Jews? He asked them. Jesus replied, is this your own question or did the others tell you about me? I am a Jew. Am I a Jew, Pilate retorted? Your own people and their leading priests brought you to me for trial. Why? What have you done? Jesus answered, look, my kingdom, again, truth is about his kingdom. It's about his rule. It's about his reign. It's not an earthly kingdom. If it were, my followers would fight to keep me from being handed over to the Jewish leaders. But my kingdom is not of this world. Pilate said, so you are a king. Jesus responded, you say, I am king. Actually, check this out. I was born and I came into the world to testify to the what? Truth. And all those who love truth. Oh, come on. We're going to have to preach this again next week. You guys aren't, aren't with it. Come on. Truth. Someone say truth. All those who love truth. Oh, my goodness. Okay, let's back up. You say I am a king, but actually, you guys know the words around here, right? You can read them. Okay. All right. Put your glasses on, okay? When the word truth comes, okay? Just get excited about that word, okay? All right. You say I'm a king. Actually, look, I came into the world to testify to the truth. And all those who love will work on it. Will recognize and it will say what is true. What is truth, Pilate asked. And then he went out again to the people and he said, this man is not guilty of any crime. See, Jesus claiming that he is truth is claiming that I'm the highest authority. I'm king over Herod. I'm king and ruler over Pilate. Why? Because I am truth. There is no higher authority than truth. Everything submits itself to truth. Everything is tested against truth if it's truly 
true. And Jesus says, there, there is no other truth. I am truth. There is no other way. There is no other truth. There is no other life. Revelation, if you guys um, read the book of Revelation, um, it, it's all connected. Revelation is 17, 14. Together, they're going to go to war against the Lamb, but the Lamb will defeat them because He is Lord of all lords and He is King of all kings. And He is called and chosen. His faithful ones will be with Him. See, Jesus is the ultimate source of truth, has been elevated to the highest place where He reigns with ultimate authority. And this is what Philippians talks about when it says, Therefore God elevated Him to the place of highest honor and gave Him the name that is above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on the earth and under the earth. There's no greater authority than that. I covered all the bases in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. I am in the highest place that every tongue would declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. See, Jesus is to come, he has come, and he forever has been. Um, if you're in the book of Revelation and you read the seven letters to the churches, all of them start with a claim. Um, we could almost do another series just on these claims on the letters to the churches. They're addressed because God himself is the author to the letters of the churches. And um, each letter um, describes a different attribute of God to the one who is fill in the blank. Um, it's interesting. Check this one out. Revelation 3, 7. This message is from the one who is holy and true. It's a claim to Jesus' identity. This letter, this message, it comes from me. I'm the holy one who is holy and true. The one who has the key of David, the king. What he opens, no one can close. And what he closes, no one can open. One last one here on truth. And then we'll fly into the way and end with the response this morning. But it's interesting, all these statements. I am bread of life, resurrection, good shepherd. John, it's, it's fun to go back and then look, John kind of presented this all to us in chapter one. And if you go back to chapter one, it's like that, that moment in a movie, if you guys have watched a movie and it starts at the end and then things get revealed in the present and then it brings you back to that, that same moment again. Check out John chapter one, verse one, God is full of grace. From him, we've received grace in place of the grace already given. In the past, God gave us grace through the law of Moses, but now grace in Truth, come to us through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only who is God is at the Father's side. The one at the Father's side has shown us what God is like. And so Jesus says, I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life. I'll give you one more N.T. Wright quote this morning. All the functions of the temple the festival, presence, priesthood, and now sacrifice have devolved onto Jesus. This is the heart of John's high Christology. And you've seen this as we've preached through this. The festivals, they're about me. The scriptures, they're about me. Your sacrifices, they're about me. All of these things, I am the eternal one, the shadow of, as Hebrews says, everything is a shadow of the real thing in heaven. There's no substitute for the real thing because I am the real thing come down from heaven to testify to truth that I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life. Hebrews 10, 19, um, if you can keep all of the messages so far into perspective. It would be fun for you to go read the book of Hebrews after this series um, because all these claims that Jesus has made, knowing these things are true of him, make the, the book of Hebrews piece together a little greater. And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can now boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving what? Way. There wasn't a way before into the most holy place, the, the private sector where God's presence dwelt in its most powerful, unveiled, and, and only the highest priest could enter. But now this way, this, this curtain has been torn, and now we have a new life-giving way into the holy place. Through what? Through Jesus. Why? Because he's the way. Through the curtain into the most holy place, and since we have a great high priest who rules in God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him.
For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. Amen. There is no other way, there is no other truth, and there is no other life. I know there's a lot to this. I know some of it's like, man, uh, it, I haven't said this yet, but let me just put this out there. Um, I told you guys up front as we started preaching through the series, I mean, it's been really academic. And, and I mean, I'm barely scratching the surface of anything we've talked about. Um, and I think what it can do, what I've felt sometimes when I've sat under teachings like this is like, well, I'm too dumb to understand the Bible, so I just need Pastor Taylor to explain it to me. I need someone smarter who's more academic. Uh, I'm the least academic person in this room, okay? Um, I just read scripture and I read it a lot. Um, the, these things we're talking about, I don't want you to be like, well, I need, like, I, I, I can't understand it. I'm not smart enough, so I should just leave the Bible reading and the Bible teaching to someone else. Here's the really cool thing. Jesus says, look, you'll, you'll know truth, and truth will reveal itself because truth, the Holy Spirit, who is the source of truth, he's going to come live inside of you. And guess what? He's also the spirit of the spirit of wisdom and the spirit of knowledge and the spirit of understanding. And he's put that inside of each of you this morning. And, and so let these things grow deeper and don't stop because knowledge scares you. Don't stop because you're like, ah, it's just too much for me. God's calling us and pushing us deeper into who he is because his desire is to dwell with you this morning. Amen. And so let me end with this one quote, and then I'm going to invite us to pray this morning. Um, I read this previously, but it's a good summation of all of the statements we've read so far about who Jesus is. And, and as I told you up front, I am the way, the truth, and the life is, is drawing upon the summation of all of those statements. So here it is again. In our sickness, we need a Savior. In our wandering as a guide, in our blindness, someone to show us the light, in our thirst, a fountain of living water that quenches forever the thirst of those who drink from it. We dead people need life. We sheep need a shepherd. We children need a teacher. The whole world needs Jesus. I invite you to stand with me this morning. And if you would, I um, just invite you to put your hands out. A sign of receiving. It's also a sign of surrender. And I, I don't know about you, but when we just, it's, it's too, I, I'm going to butcher the reference. It's in Psalms and David's talking and he's like, look, these, these knowledges, these wisdoms, these, it's too much for me. Who can hold them? Who can... It, that's what should happen at the revelation of who Jesus is. God, who can hold this in, these statements of who you are? And, and so just with that, that reverence, that awe, that surrender, Jesus, your Lord, you are the one from heaven. You are God. You are that way, that truth, that life. And yet in all of that, in this weight that I can't even carry, you've deposited your own life of your spirit within me. Who can fathom that? And so hopefully what it does and what I'm going to invite you to do is just stand beside yourself this morning. Jesus, we receive who you are, God, unfiltered who you are. God, you're the source of light. You're the source of truth. You're the shepherd. You're the bread of life. Got all these realities, and as we shared up front, most of us aren't even appropriating or understanding or living out the truth of everything that we have that's within you, the power of your name that's been elevated above all other names, King of kings, Lord of lords, ruler of life, and yet you also look at us and you call us friend. You call us children. God, who can just even stand in the reality of everything that you are, who you are? And so God, um, just beside myself this morning, each of us just stand here humbled to call you friend, to call you Lord, to call you our shepherd. And Lord, you said that your sheep, they know you, they listen to your voice, and they come when you call. And so, 
Lord, we just want to be humbled and submitted before you this morning, Jesus, to receive everything that you are in our lives and for that to be something that we don't just intellectually understand, not something we just emotionally process through our our feelings, but God, we want to live in the identity of who you claim to be and that you've deposited that identity into each of us, that if any man would be in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has gone away and the new has come. So Jesus, would you bring revelation to that new life this morning and would we live and walk in light of it and who you are, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen.